Um, I'm Lara Downey, one of the diabetes nurse educators. Um, and I'll be talking to you about um, pump adjustments today. And then uh, I'll be followed by Nicole Sanders, who's um, one of our senior dietitians, who will also um, talk in more detail today. The better? I don't know, I was just asking you when you want me to start. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to start? Okay. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Lara Downey. I'm one of the diabetes nurse educators uh, from the diabetes department um, presenting to you today about the advanced insulin pump workshop. Um, I will also be followed by one of our senior dietitians, Nicole Sanders, um, who will talk more about the dietetics around advanced pumping as well. Um, so I will be covering, covering very briefly about the advanced features um, of the pump, which is the dual, square or extended wave, but this will be covered in much more detail by Nicole. Um, and we'll also look at interpreting insulin pump downloads um, and decision making on insulin settings. Um, our clinic admin, sorry, our pump admin coordinator um, should have sent you the presentation that we're going through today to follow along with, um, as well as our interpreting insulin pump downloads guide that you guys can refer to. Um, there should be their age appropriate guide, so um, for five and above, sorry, for above five and five and below. Okay, so the advanced bolus features, um, uh, mainly you can give it just a normal bolus and if you are having um, a varied meal, so something that may contain higher amounts of fat or protein, that you find that there's a bit of a meal rise after you would give a normal bolus, we can give something that's either called a square wave that's used in a Medtronic pump um, and you can set that for... Um, Generally, we say to start with two to four hours, um, and that will just release a little bit of insulin um, across that two or four hours to cover the type of food that's being eaten. But the most common one that we find people use is the dual wave in the Mectronic pump or the extended bolus um, that you can uh, set up in the tandem. And that usually offers um, Part, you can split the bolus, so you could give part of the bolus up front, and then you could give the rest of the bolus over um, a longer period of time to stop that increasing meal rise that may happen from certain types of foods. Some good examples of foods that do cause that gradual rise um, because of fats or proteins are pizzas or pastas. Um, and Nicole will go through that in a little bit more detail with you later on. So when we're looking at um, uh, some of the general settings that we need to make sure um, are, are all up to date. It was a really good idea to check the time and date from time to time, make sure that they are correct, especially if you're having any issues with flat batteries or change of batteries. Um, sometimes it can alter the date and time, so always really good to double check. Also, ensuring that your target BG, um, usually we set it at 5 to 5.5. .5. Um, and the main reason we aim for um, that target range in our pumps um, is that the calculator in the pump, whenever you're giving a bolus, will always try and bring your blood glucose level down to that target level. And that is in between four, four and eight. So we really are trying to keep your blood glucose levels within that target range. And lastly, looking at our active insulin time. So generally we set that at three hours. Um, the main reason for that is because of the um, insulin action time of the short acting insulin. So most insulins, um, the insulins that you can use in the pump is the Nova Rapid or Humalog. And these insulins usually take that one and a half hours for the insulin to become active in the body and start to come out of the body. Usually we see by about three, sometimes three to, to four hours. So whenever you give a bolus, the pump is aware that you've got insulin in your body for that three hour period. And if you give another bolus, 
um, within that three hours, the pump can actually recognise that you still have insulin on board and will actually reduce the next bolus by a little bit to prevent stacking of insulin and therefore prevent hypos. So it's a really good safety mechanism in each of the pumps. Um, then looking at our um, general insulin pump requirements. So it is recommended that you would test your blood glucose levels four to six times a day um, and ensuring that you're putting the blood glucose level in um, to the pump when you're bolusing for each of your meals across the day. This ensures that um, if your blood glucose level is that little bit higher, um, extra insulin will be given with your meal dose to help bring your level back down to that target range. However, I'm sure a lot of you are on um, continuous glucose monitoring, um, and it, in particular, the um, Dexcom G5 doesn't require that many finger pricks, so we just need to ensure that um, you're putting in your blood glucose level before bolusing, um, and that you're doing your, your two calibrations um, a day. Um, if you're on the tandem pump and wearing the G5, that blood glucose level automatically should populate into your bolus, um, and so it's already already there when you give a bolus, which is also quite handy. Um, we encourage you to change your sights um, every two to three days, um, mainly to reduce the risks of infection at your pump sites um, and ensure that um, the reservoirs, we also need to change the insulin every two to three days so that... Um, what we do find is that the insulin can actually react with the plastic if we leave it in that, for, that sort of reservoir for too long. And we want to make sure that the insulin is working effectively. Um, so making sure that you're changing your site frequently and also moving it round when you're changing your sites. Um, and then lastly, uh, doing some regular pump up loads. We suggest every two to four weeks, um, just for you to be able to have a look at, um, see how uh, blood glucose levels are trending and whether you need to make any changes to insulin settings. Um, and it's also really good if you can upload your pumps uh, the night before clinic so that we can get the clinic slowing really quickly as well. And finally, it is also really good to upload your pump quite regularly in case you have any issues with your pump in terms of a pump failure because then you would have all your um, information and settings saved on your um, uploaded system and when you get your new pump um, uh, after your pump failure you'll have all of the information that you can then put into your pump and continue pumping um, so that makes life a little bit easier if you're having to deal with something like that. Okay, so looking at when um, what the uploads actually look like. So this is from CareLink, which is the first page of reporting um, for the Medtronic pumps. And what this actually shows here um, is uh, on this side, the number of times that you've done a blood glucose level or put it in a blood glucose into the pump um, and looking at your bolus wizard events. So how many times that you've actually bolused and with those boluses, how often it was um, given with a meal or with a correction. Um, here, this side here is actually showing how often you're changing your pump site. Um, so this person is changing every three days or so um, and that they're filling the cannula um, and the tubing as well. And just down the side here is just showing um, how many, sus uh, how long the pump's been suspended for each day. So this is only on the CareLink Medtronic system. Um, a good thing to look at is how much daily insulin um, should your child actually be using. And we have a rough guide here um, that sometimes can indicate whether or not we need to make any changes. So generally for a lot of kids before they go into puberty, they're requiring 0.75 to one point, uh, sorry, to one unit per kilo per day. So if you're finding that your child is on um, quite a lot less insulin that, than um, what they may be requiring based on their weight. Um, it could be because they're still in honeymoon or um, they do lots and lots of exercise so might not need as much insulin. Or if you're finding that blood glucose levels are sitting quite high and that um, 
the level of insulin doesn't quite match up with their weight, that can be an indicator that we do need to make some changes and increase insulin based on some um, sometimes growth and weight gain. So that um, sometimes can be a good indicator that, that more insulin needs, um, needs to be given. And for teenagers, um, usually after puberty, that uh, level of insulin uh, requirement usually increases. So between 1 to 1.3 units per kilo a day is what we see quite often. Um, and then looking at the, the proportion of um, the total daily dose of insulin um, that's given in a day. So we generally would see that the bolus, um, the amount of, of bolus insulin that's given across the day is roughly between 50 to 70% of their total amount of insulin. So I just put my cursor down here and you can see um, this particular uh, report here is looking at CareLink again, and I'll show you um, Diasend for the tandem pumps next. Um, but here it shows where the total daily dose of insulin um, is that the patient or the child has had. And so usually when we're working out a total daily dose, we would add up the last five days of insulin. So there we've got five days, add them together and divide it by five. And that actually gives us an, an average of the total amount of insulin that your child is having. And then here next to it, it actually is telling us the amount of insulin um, that's been given across the day with bolusing, so with either meals or corrections or both. So for this patient, they're having roughly between um, 50 to 70 percent over those last few days. So that's a fairly, a fairly good proportion. If we're seeing that the bolusing is quite heavy so if we're seeing that it's sitting more in the um, sort of uh, up to 80 and 90 percent it may indicate that we need more basal in the background to make the proportion even um, across the day. So in a diacen report, so this is for our patients using the tandem pump, um, on your, this is what your report here looks like. Um, and down here it usually shows where you've had your site change, so there's this little um, symbol at the bottom. Uh, and also where you can read your total daily doses just down the side here as well. So same thing, each day has been given a total, a total daily dose. And to work out your average, you would add all five of them up and divide by five. Um, that helps us to work out um, how to make adjustments. And then next to that, where's my little cursor, um, is showing what your uh, bolus percentage um, is for each of those days as well. So then how do we check um, that the carb carbohydrate ratio is accurate? So what we suggest if you're gonna do a, um, a full review of your pump upload, it's not a bad idea to um, work out what your average carbohydrate ratio should be. Doesn't mean that's what you need to change it to, um, but it is a good indicator of where your carbohydrate ratio could be sitting um, and whether or not uh, it's safe to, to increase or to change. So if your child is um, five or above, um, you would use what we call the 500 rule. So we would say 500 divided by that total daily dose that we worked out in the previous slide. Um, and that will give you your average carb ratio to go by. If your child is less than five, we use what's called the 300 rule. So it would be 300 divided by that total daily dose to get an average of your carb ratio. And then, when we're looking at our reports, we're looking for patterns. So you would look at the last three or four days of patterns and see um, if you're seeing a pattern of high blood glucose levels, where the blood glucose level is more than two millimoles above that pre-meal blood glucose level um, after your meal, um, then we would look at changing that carb ratio to give more insulin. And the golden rule is that the lower the number, the higher the insulin, of, the amount of insulin that will be given. So if your child's carb ratio maybe at breakfast time is one to 20, and you're finding that always two hours after breakfast, they're sitting quite a bit higher, so more than two millimoles higher, we could suggest changing that carbohydrate ratio from one to 20 down to one to 18. So this just gives you a guide of how to make those incremental changes and, and to make them safely as well. And similarly, if you've um, found that your child was going low two hours after their meal <clears throat> by more than two millimoles, um, we would look at the graph here. So for example, if the patient had a ratio of one to 15, 
we would change it to 1 to 18. So we actually would make the carb ratio higher to give less insulin. It's all a little back to front and upside down. Um, and all of this is in your um, interpreting insulin um, guide as well. So when we look at um, changing your sensitivity factor, um, and so your sensitivity factor is also known as your correction factor. So when your blood glucose level is high, um, it, we can give a correction bolus, and that will help to bring the blood glucose level down to that target, um, that target setting that we set in the pump. To work out that insulin sensitivity factor, we do another little maths equation, which we call the 100 rule. Uh, and that is 100 divided by that total daily dose that we worked out in the beginning slides. <clears throat> um, and if we work out that our average um, sensitivity factor is between one of these settings, then we can work out how much to adjust that sensitivity factor by. So, for example, let's um, say that I worked out the sensitivity factor was 2.3 on, on average. And when I was giving a correction at 10 o'clock at night, um, say the patient was sitting at 15, and when I give a correction, the level is only coming down to 12. It's not coming down into that target range. So I would look at... Um, at this one, so if the blood glucose level is still too high two or three hours after a correction, I would decrease the ISF by 0.2. So the same rule applies. The lower the number, the higher the insulin dose that we're giving. So similarly, if I found I gave a correction and it was dropping the blood glucose level down very rapidly and below the target range, um, I would change it the other way. So if the blood glucose level was too low two to three hours after I gave a correction, I would increase my insulin sensitivity factor by 0.2. The other thing to think about, and just so that you understand, an insulin sensitivity is what one unit would bring the blood glucose level down by. So if, for example, I said my um, sensitivity was one to two. It means that one unit of insulin will bring my blood glucose level down by two millimoles. So if um, my blood glucose level was 15 and I wanted to bring it down to about five and my sensitivity factor was one unit would bring it down by two each time, that works out at um, 15 to 5 is 10. So I would be giving five units of insulin to bring that blood glucose level down into target. So that's sort of how it's calculated. Okay, and then finally going on to how do we um, adjust our basal rate? So we usually we find that your basal rate is between 30 to 50% of that total, of your total daily dose of insulin. Um, and it does say here you can have up to four, four different ra basal rates should be sufficient, but we do see that quite a few people can range from having about four to, to six to eight sometimes uh, different basal patterns. So it is individual, um, but it's probably a bit easier to manage if there, if there are a few less. So when we're looking at changing our basal rate, sometimes that can be one of the trickier things to change. And what we're looking for is if there's a change of blood glucose levels between meals, and in particular overnight, that seems to be the easier um, thing to adjust is when it's overnight. So how we would change that is by looking at, we've worked out our total daily dose. So if I've worked out that uh, my patient's total daily dose is 15, for example, I would look at in this area here. Um, and if I see that the blood glucose level is drifting up between meals, I would increase that basal, basal insulin by 0.05 units per hour. And similarly, if I found that the blood glucose level was drifting down between meals, I would decrease the basal insulin by 0.05. So this guide is, is all, um, all of this information is within that guide that you've been provided as well. So um, then that takes us to monitoring and what we should do after we make any changes. 
So I think the best thing to do, especially if we're increasing um, blood glucose levels um, into, over the evening and making some of those bigger changes, it is a really good idea to in, increase your overnight tests or at least checking on your CGM, just so that you can make sure that the levels are trending okay um, and that we haven't um, made too many st too strong um, adjustments. Um, and if we have made an adjustment that has sent um, the patient a little bit lower, we can always change it back. And that's the beauty of, of you know, being able to adjust the pumps in that way. So I've just got a few examples that we can go through looking at our reports and what they sort of mean. So I'm going to start off with um, Diasend reports. So these are the reports that you will be looking at if you're on the tandem T-Slim pump. Um, and quite often a lot of our patients are on both the Tandem and the Dexcom G5. So you can, you will actually be able to look at reports that show your CGM tracing and compare that to some of the reports that you will actually be able to view um, with your pump upload. So, and, and comparing the two. So this one in particular is showing us um, where the um, CGM has been calibrated with the the, uh, the red triangles and down the bottom here with the green triangles is showing us when bolusing and carbs have been given. So we can actually see how things are matching up and when some of the rises are happening. And then matching that with this line that's going along here is looking at basal patterns, so how the basal is changing. And these um, blue lines coming up are the um, boluses that have been given, so they're in relation to the carb um, little arrows that you can see in the CGM. And then just above each of those little blue bars uh, is telling you how much insulin has been given um, for each of those boluses. So then you can start to actually match up and see. Um, so if the carb ratio has worked, if when the blood glucose level has been a bit higher, has the insulin, has the blood glucose level come back down into target? And are we finding that, that things are accurate and where we want them to be? Um, so here is another example. So these are the reports that we, we do look at quite a lot. Um, for the, for uh, this Diasend report, high blood glucose levels are colour coded in red. Um, blood glucose levels that are in target are in green and levels, we haven't got any in this example, but levels that are hypo or low um, are usually in a purpley colour. The other things to look at in the chart here is underneath where a bolus has been given, um, if it's for carbs, it actually says how many grams of carbs have been bolused. And then in the square below, it says how much insulin has been given for the bolus. And when there is a square, it indicates that a correction is given as well. Um, and I'll just find an example here. There's a couple here where you can see there's no blood glucose level been put in, but there has been carbs given and a bolus given here. And there's no box around that because it hasn't been given as a correction, just as a carb bolus. <clears throat> the other thing to look at is looking for any patterns. So um, the main thing that we're looking for when we're make any, making any changes is that you can see patterns over the last three or four days. Because each, you can have days that are completely off the chart and they don't quite make any sense. And we don't want to be making changes on, on every single day. It just makes it really difficult to manage. And then we, we don't, it makes it much harder to get things into target. Um, so, and I also think it's a really good idea to break down um, when you're looking at all of these numbers, sometimes it can be really confusing. So you break down uh, changes into sections. So you'd be looking at breakfast compared to lunch, compared to dinner, and then what's actually happening overnight. And quite often I think it's a good idea to start with dinner and how dinner um, is then impacting the flow of the night. Um, so I'll just go on to the next couple. So as you can see, this patient here has had a couple of really good days in the middle here and things sort of petered off um, the next day and they had a little bit of a struggle the next day because their levels were sitting up a bit higher. This could be for a few different reasons, um, whether or not there was an issue with a site. And as you can see down here, there was actually a site change done at the end of this day. Um, so potentially the, inch, the actual pump site itself may have caused um, the blood glucose level to start to rise if there happened to be a, a kink at the site or an infection or it wasn't sitting in properly, it might have been tugged out a little bit. So it's always really good to check your site if um, corrections aren't working properly. Um, 
and you've, and you've had previously, you've had really good days of levels. Um, it could also indicate perhaps that um, your child is not feeling very well. So um, usually sickness causes blood glucose levels to rise that little bit, so that could be another indicator. And always good on a day like this, um, this particular day when the levels are quite high, just to check ketones every now and again and see um, if the ketone levels are starting to creep up, because that could indicate that there's not actually enough insulin going in or the pump site's not actually working and there's no insulin and going in if ketones are starting to rise as well. Um, here's another example. So I'll just have a quick, yeah. So this example here, um, we'll look at what we might actually change. So looking at, this looks like um, dinner time, around this time here, where blood glucose levels seem to be um, generally a little bit higher by dinner time. And whenever we're giving a bolus for our dinner, it's not actually bringing the blood glucose level down. And it looks like a correction has also been given and that's not bringing the level down either. Um, the other thing that, I've, that is interesting is that even after this patient has eaten, generally we bolus for a meal and we should wait at least two hours for the insulin from that meal to actually start to take effect. Because as we know, it takes at least one, one and a half, sometimes um, one to one and a half hours for that insulin to start actually working. So if we're testing and checking one hour after we've eaten, the blood glucose level is going to be high. Um, and if we're giving a correction bolus too soon, you might actually stack the insulin and bring the patient down to be having a low. So we do need to, when, when you give a bolus, give it that at least two hours before we give another bolus, especially for a correction. Um, however, what we are seeing is that quite often I feel the boluses at dinner time aren't really working and bringing the blood glucose level down. So we could look at changing the carb ratio there. Um, another thing is um, quite often the patient's actually waking up with slightly higher levels above target. Um, and in particular with this one, a bolus was actually given overnight and it has actually brought the blood glucose level down, but it looks like they needed a bolus to actually bring that level down. So what that indicates to me is perhaps um, our correction at night time, so this one in particular, when the patient's 19, hasn't actually worked and brought the blood glucose level down far enough, but also, that perhaps the background insulin, so the basal, basal insulin, may also need to be changed because the blood glucose level um, continues to stay high. And that's a really good example here where this patient was 8.4 and there was a small bolus given, but gradually up until what looks like about four o'clock in the morning, the blood glucose level has actually just steadily risen. So it'd be a really good idea to change that basal insulin at that time of night. So if we make one or two little changes at a time and then give um, about three or four days for those settings to um, start to take place and to watch to see if they've actually worked and then we can review again and look at whether we need to make any further changes or if those changes you made actually worked. This next slide um, actually looks at what the, um, the settings are for this um, patient. So when we were looking at the basal settings, so that's um, the basal profile for this patient. Um, the timing starts from midnight. And for this patient, they're on one unit of insulin per hour from one o'clock till six o'clock in the morning. So we could look at increasing that um, based on what um, her total daily dose is and what um, has been suggested in our guide to adjust that basal by. Um, so, uh, with the carbohydrate ratio settings, um, I think I suggested for dinner would probably be a good place to start that we change that carbohydrate ratio. And their ratio is already um, sitting at 10. So I would probably suggest, and fairly short in our guide here, it would suggest that we would change that carb ratio down to nine so that we're giving a bit of extra insulin um, for dinner. And then lastly, with our sensitivity, I think I also suggested that our corrections at night aren't really working. So it may be that we change this sensitivity that's set at 2.3 and move that down to 2.1. And that will give a little bit of extra insulin when we're giving a correction to bring levels into target. Then we'd make those changes and give it a few days um, to see how they go.
Uh, this is just another example of the die send, um, looking at what a, a hypo would look like. So this patient has had a few hypos at the sort of earlier days of the week. Um, looks like early in the morning and looks like uh, just before dinner, perhaps. Um, and then they've come up quite high. So it looks like um, when this patient was sitting at 2.4, we've given lots of treatment. They've also had dinner, but maybe we haven't bolus for everything they've eaten. And then after that, their blood glucose level has shot up quite high. And that's probably from potentially uh, over treatment um, and then needing a correction. And we could look at um, this particular day as well. It, it doesn't seem that that's something that is a continuing pattern. One particular day where the child might have been doing quite a lot of sport um, or um, maybe a missed bolus that had happened in the day. So it's always good to look at um, those sort of days when things aren't quite matching up and asking a few questions about what may have happened in that day to cause some of the, the hypos before we make any big drastic changes. Because the other days actually show that her levels have actually, this patient's levels have actually been sitting up that little bit higher. Um, and, and where we might make changes with that. And it may be that you just focus on one area at a time and make changes um, slowly. And there is what um, another, so that's the actual um, patterns that are related to that particular upload. So you can have a look at that and see what you uh, think might need to be changed. And then we go into a couple of the CareLink examples that patients who are using the Medtronic pumps um, will see when they upload their pump. So similar kind of thing in terms of um, the colours um, representing blood glucose levels. This patient here is having significant hypos. So in the Medtronics, it's um, indicated in red. The high blood glucose levels or those above target are in yellow. And then levels that um, are within target, they don't have any colour. Um, and similarly, when you're um, giving a bolus, um, the amount of carb is actually coloured in the black boxes and it says how many carbs are bolused for and underneath that uh, is the amount of insulin that's bolused. If it has a little circle around it, it means that it was a bolus um, that was a correction as well as maybe a food bolus. <clears throat> So looking at this pattern, it looks like this patient is quite having quite a few lows in the middle part of the day, um, which we, is a very, very obvious pattern. So it might be, looking at breakfast here, that our carb ratios are actually just too strong and always bringing the patient down low. And perhaps our basal that's that's in the background is actually also too strong. So we could actually looking, look at reducing the basal in the background at that particular time. Um, it also looks like, I wonder if the um, carb ratio also um, in this middle time of the day might be strong as well. So I would suggest starting with those changes and then looking at what's actually happening overnight. So it does look like this patient does trend up a little bit overnight before they start to come down in the morning. However, on this particular night, the levels sat absolutely beautifully. So that would indicate to me that I'm not really all that keen on increasing our background insulin overnight just yet. I think if we look at fixing the hypos in the middle of the day first, and then seeing how that might flow on to the rest of the day. Um, and potentially what could happen here is if the patient is actually has a high level, instead of just testing and putting the, looking at the blood glucose level, we could also give a bolus and give a correction bolus and see if that blood glucose level will actually come down. Um, so just below is the um, patient's insulin settings. So this is what your basal pattern would look like um, and the carbohydrate ratio. So for this patient, it's the same across the day. They're on a ratio of one to 10 and the sensitivity is the same all across the day as well, which is just showing um, a sensitivity of one unit will drop it by two millimoles. So I would suggest that we put in a new time plan um, a new time pattern for the carb ratio setting here. And we would probably say from, I would say eight o'clock in the morning, um, we would add a new time pattern from maybe eight until seven. Um, we could change this carb ratio from 10 up to 12 and see if we can prevent some of the hypos that are happening during the day. And also change the basal pattern probably from, um, 
We could add in a time there actually and make it from 10 o'clock in the morning and change that until six o'clock at night. And we could drop that basal pattern down to potentially 0.8 or even a little bit further so that we're giving less insulin across the day. I'll just go through a couple more examples. There are a few more here, which you guys can have a, have a look at um, and see if you can look at what sort of um, ideas that you might have about uh, what, you, what you think might need to be changed. So here there's quite an obvious couple of patterns as well. In the middle of the day, um, blood glucose levels seem to be within target. And then just before dinner, um, blood glucose levels seem to be that little bit higher. So it could be that um, the carb ratio we need to change for afternoon tea um, so that we're not coming up a bit higher. Also, it would be really good if blood glucose levels were entered at afternoon tea so that we could actually, if the levels are a bit higher, we could give uh, added correction. Or we could look at giving a little bit more background insulin um, between that afternoon tea to dinner time to stop the higher levels. So there are a couple of things we could do. What is interesting is that um, after uh, dinner, blood glucose levels seem to be coming down um, to um, blood glucose with to levels between range, which is really good. But by midnight, we're actually coming up a little bit higher. So I think what we would actually do is increase our basal um, amount in the background, probably from 10 o'clock, because it's a really obvious pattern that after 10 o'clock, blood glucose levels seem to rise. And also, when these corrections have been given, they're not working and the patient is still actually waking up that little bit higher. So it's probably a good idea we'd increase the basal from 10 p.m. Um, potentially to, we could say, um, so we'd add in a time bracket down in our basal pattern here. So we could say from 10 o'clock, we want to give a little bit more insulin, um, maybe up to, uh, We'd have to look in our guide to see how much we'd actually adjust it by based on our total daily dose, but we may adjust it up to 1.75 or 1.7 and uh, change our insulin sensitivity. So over here we've got one pattern that lasts the whole day. And I would add in an extra time block and we could put from um, midnight uh, until probably 6 a.m. Um, we could change that to 2.2. So when, by making um, the setting lower, we would be giving more insulin. Um, yeah, so they're the kind of the, the couple of changes I would suggest making. So there's a couple more there that you can have a look at and review and have a bit of a practice. So here's a couple as well that would be um, a, a good little test. So which one of these, I guess, would you change for your insulin carb ratio or your insulin sensitivity factor? So if we look at day one, the blood glucose um, before the meal was 5.8 and we gave a bolus for 30 grams of carbs. And then two hours later, the blood glucose level was 8.2. So would we change, and this is, bear in mind, this is a pattern we're seeing. So would you change your insulin carb ratio or your insulin sensitivity factor? So see what you think. What I would suggest uh, is that we would change your insulin carb ratio because that blood glucose level before the meal was spot on. Um, but a few hours later, it had actually risen by more, the three millimoles more. For the second example, we'd look at the BG before the meal sitting at 6.2 uh, and the carbs we bolus for was 36 grams and then two hours later the blood glucose level was 7.6. Do you think that we should change the insulin carb ratio or the insulin sensitivity factor? Uh, to be honest, I actually think we wouldn't change anything because there's been very little change. In fact, only about a millimole difference. So in fact, that carb ratio is working beautifully. So we'd leave that. Um, and the blood glucose level is not that much higher. So they wouldn't have been given a lot of insulin for a, a, a correction. And then lastly, this blood glucose here of 10.5 um, before the meal, and they had a bolus of 28 grams of carbs Two hours later, we checked and the blood glucose level is 2.6, which is obviously a hypo. So what do you think you might change, the carb ratio or the sensitivity factor? And I think that one's pretty obvious. I think we changed the insulin sensitivity factor, the correction factor, because that blood glucose level was high before the meal and 
We gave insulin for the food, but we also gave insulin for that high level and it's brought them right down low. So I'd change the sensitivity factor first and then, and then see how you go from there. Um, you should have all been given pump failure guidelines, hopefully at your, either your pump start or your pump, first week pump review. It's a really good guide to have to refer to if your pump does happen to fail. Um, if it does happen to fail, please call your um, pump company, so AMSL or Medtronic, um, and they generally will replace your pump and send you a new one. Usually you'll get a new one within two or three days. But you will have to go back to insulin injections in the meantime. So it's really good to make sure that you have um, a supply of Lantus, or a script for Lantus um, in your pens and also your short acting insulin in your pens as well so that you can go back to um, multiple daily injections just for that period. So the pump failure guideline goes through that and how to work it all out for you. And obviously always if you get stuck you can contact the triage line at the hospital for assistance. Um, in terms of pump reviews, um, we do do pump reviews um, via triage, Monday to Friday. Um, if they're urgent, um, definitely upload your pump and give us a call. Let us know if you're having lots and lots of hypos or you're trying to manage sick days. <clears throat> so that's obviously between 8.30 and 4.30. For any other reviews, so if you're you've uploaded at home and you've had a little look and you would like to make some changes but you're not sure. And it's also a really good idea if you're starting to make your own adjustments and you want to get a little bit more confident or a little bit more support, definitely call us at triage. But we would suggest if you could upload the evening or the night before and email our PCH diabetes triage um, and say, can you please have a look at this and give me a call? We will return your call that next morning. Um, it just gives us more time to look over your pump um, upload and then we can put, put extra time in. Um, so we'd prefer it if, if the uploads and the emails come through before two o'clock in the afternoon so we've got plenty of time to go through them with you. Sometimes if we get them at the end of the day, we just don't have enough time with some of the other urgent calls that come through at that time of day. Um, and as I've just said here, so our non-urgent reviews we won't do after two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and that is all from me. So thank you very much. I hope that was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, email them through um, now or to our diabetes triage line, which is PCH diabetes triage, or one word at health.wa.gov.au or you can contact the triage line on 6456 and leave your message after you press number two. Um, and we can answer any of your questions or help you to review some of your uploads with you just so that you get some practice. Um, and obviously don't be afraid to upload and have a look. Um, good luck, thank you.